Welcome to my channel and welcome to this uh, fourth comic book reading set. Now, as we talked about uh, in the previous video, we're going to be doing uh, 32 comic book readings. There is uh, 16 books that I chose and 16 books that you guys chose. And this comic book, A Life Force by Will Eisner, is uh, one of the books from my list. Now, I haven't gone through and organized um, the, the list that we came up with, the 32 books, and in which order I'm going to read them in. But what I really wanted to do was start off the reading set with this book. And what we're going to do is read a very short chapter, because this is sort of a graphic novel format, right? We're going to read a short chapter from this book, it's, uh, chapter 6, and it's seven short pages okay and the reason i wanted to start off uh, with will eisner's work is because uh, i wanted to start off with a bang and this book these seven pages that we're going to read pretty much do that um, as far as i'm concerned there's seven um, of the most brilliant pages um, published in comic books right some it's some of the best some of the some of the greatest work you'll ever see uh, the whole book is actually and almost everything Will Eisner's ever done is uh, considered to be a phenomenal right and I haven't even come close to reading uh, a sig even a significant amount from Will Eisner's work I've read some of his earlier stuff um, especially some of the stuff he did um, in the golden age of comics from um, 1940 to 1952 he published a series called the spirit and he's really uh for some he's in the comic book and medium anyway as far as heroes go he's best known for the spirit uh for that series that he was publishing but he he got involved in the medium in the, in the uh, mid 1930s at an early age he got into the industry when he was 19 years old and um, he was one of the few actually from that period that was able to make a go at um at the comic book medium he actually started he, he formed his first company in the industry when he was in his early 20s and he was one of the few people that was able to make a, a good living off cartooning i guess that's what it was really referred to back then right because they uh, people who were making comic books a lot of them anyway they were also doing advertisement work and marketing work and Will Eisner did a fair bit of that so he got involved in the industry in the early 1930s uh, when he was really young he formed his own company he f created his first comic book series uh, to a certain degree his his creation where it went for a long run was uh, the spirit from 1940 to 1952 and then for some reason he ended up taking a break uh, at the beginning of the 1950s from the comic book medium from what i understand from what i've read he didn't think that the uh, that the comic book industry was going to evolve into what it is now right so he took a break from the comic book medium and started producing a lot of uh, uh, instructional material some technical um technical material for the u.s military and other companies as well where he was working basically for the pentagon um for one of the one of the series that he was working on for the pentagon was uh, or for the military was prevented the maintenance manuals right on how to do things how to clean your guns and how to i haven't read any of that material uh when i was looking up the history i came across this information and i actually want to you know i've already started checking online to see uh some of the books that he's published during that period from 1952 basically all the way to the 1970s he he worked on this type of material um so i'm sort of tracking some of those books and i'm uh, going to try to get my hands on some of them and if i do or when i do we'll definitely be uh doing a reading of those as well okay so he's huge at the beginning from the beginning of the golden age he was involved in comic books did a little shift in his um, i guess career in the industry and went and worked for the military and other companies creating instructional manuals and stuff like this and then in the 1970s he came back to the medium to the comic book uh, industry right to the comic book format 
And what he did was basically uh, start putting out graphic novels. And Will Eisner is uh, sort of credited with giving birth to the graphic novel format. So what he was doing was uh, releasing some of the chapters, some of the pages from his graphic novels, right? Serializing them, stuff like this, and then putting everything together and releasing them as graphic novel format. And that's what a life force is. That's what this book is, okay? And as far as, uh, you know, what this story is about, this is part two of a trilogy. The first part of this trilogy is called A Contract with God, and it was, um, you know, consolidated and printed for the first time in 1978. A Life Force uh, was put together and printed for the first time in one complete format in 1980, uh, 1988. But before that, from 1983 to 1995, some of the material, I'm not, I'm not sure of all of it, but some of it was released in chunks, right? Um, sort of serialized, well, I don't know if it's, they call it serializing or not, but it was being released slowly. And then finally in 1988, he compiled everything together and printed this book for the first time. And the third part of this series is called Dropsy Avenue, and it was published in 1995. Now, I haven't read the first part and I haven't read the second part. I was lucky enough to get my hands on this um, about a year ago, I guess, uh, because one of the local comic shops I go to, they, um, they have a box in the front or a few boxes in the front of the store where they've been for the last two years, basically, putting in graphic novels that they're selling a 50% off sale. So whenever I go to that comic book store, I pick up, uh, you know, singles and stuff like this, and I flip through the section where they have uh, stuff that's for sale. And I usually do that for most comic book stores. Uh, and I sort of, uh, for this store anyway, I go through and if there's any graphic novels uh, that I find interesting, I pull out. And what I did uh, for this book, how I got my hands on this book was, I pulled out a whole bunch of uh, graphic novels I was gonna buy with my singles and I sort of hit my budget, right? And if you're buying comic books, you have to set yourself a sort of a budget, otherwise um, you'll be hurting because it's not a it's not a cheap uh, it's not an inexpensive industry to get into, or it's not an inexpensive hobby uh, to get into because these books, um, you know, once you start buying, uh, it ends up hitting your um, budget, right? So I usually have a budget when I go into a comic book store what I'm going to spend that day or that month. And I had already hit my hit my budget, but I saw this thing and I picked it up and I um, wanted to read a Will Eisner book, right? Because I've read um, I've read some Will Eisner before. I've read some of the stuff he did with the Spirit. I haven't even come close to reading a large chunk of that series. I read some of the other stuff that he's done as well, just chunks, segments. But I had never sat down and read one of Eisner's novels from front to back, right? So I picked this up and I sort of went, okay, you know, I've hit my budget, what do I do? So I flipped this thing around and I read the reviews of this, okay? And once I read this sentence, I put back one of the other graphic novels I had grabbed and I grabbed this one and I can't remember where I put back, um, but I am very, very happy to have picked this one up. Okay, and let me read you uh, the sentence here, and then we'll talk about what this, this story is about. Flip through it and read the seven pages that I want to read, okay? Now, let me show you what sold this book to me, or what made me pick it up. And this is the sentence. It sta states, I think this is Eisner's best work of all time, a masterpiece. And I went, okay, that's good. And I read who had written this, and this was Robert Crumb, right? So Crumb wrote that A Life Force by Will Eisner is his best work, right? And that's like, that's saying a lot. So that was a selling point for me. As far as uh, what this story is about, now this story 
is um, takes place during the depression in the 1930s okay and I believe the trilogy is sort of chronicling the life of the characters here because I haven't read the first part and I haven't read the second part I'm not 100% sure if the same characters appear in all three books but basically all three books are the same format they're talking about uh, the life experiences of the people living in the neighborhood and for this one basically is the life experiences of people living in the 1930s during the depression uh, in a neighborhood in a tenement in the Bronx and it sort of goes through and it starts introducing characters and how they interact with other characters and sort of uh, flows in in you know the shows interaction with one character with this character and then um, you know follows that character where they're interacting with another one and then comes back picks up with this character so it sort of mingles flows between um, you know what's happening with these people okay and it is absolutely brilliant it is absolutely brilliant so let's um, let's flip through this thing um, and take a look at some of the uh, we'll take a look at some of the information uh, at the beginning of the book where you know we always do uh, you know take a look at for all the readings that we've done we sort of take a look at the front page and um, here let me take a read this front page to you anyway and this uh, panel is actually from at the early stages of the book so we'll come across it when we're flipping flipping through it um, and this is one of the main characters in the book and he's sort of stuck in an alley and he's talking to a cockroach because he's contemplating his life and stuff like this and he turns to the cockroach and says so mr cockroach what are you struggling for to maybe stay alive a few days more and this is sort of this little these few words are basically what this book is about it's about life now let's just look and read some of the stuff um, a life force a graphic novel by will eisner and will eisner sort of been credited with giving birth to the graphic novel format this type of this these type of compilations right uh, huge accomplishment right sort of revolutionary I guess introducing this type of format to the industry um, Will, the Will Eisner Library from W.W. Norton and Company hardcover compilation a contract with God uh, life on Dopsy Avenue Will Eisner's New York Rush paperbacks and these are some of the other books available by Eisner and just to give you you know uh, how powerful his work is uh, I think it should be listed here but he, Eisner is actually done an adaptation of Moby Dick which um, when I was reading through the history of uh, Eisner to make this video in, in preparation of making this video I found that out and I'm gonna go to my local comic book store and see if they can get their hands on it uh, because I've never read Moby Dick and wow uh, adaptation by Will Eisner I love to get my hands on that and have a read through it um, and here's some of the fine print right um, copyright uh, 2006 so this is the 2006 print run of this um, and this thing's originally copyrighted 1983 1984 and 1985 and this is uh, those three years are 83 84 and 85 I believe he released some of the material from this book and then in 1988 is the first time that he compiled it all together and printed it as uh, one graphic novel okay um, and then for information about permission to reduce sections of this book about New York um, manufactured by RDW when a division Library of Congress I has a catalog but one volume edition as follows will eisner the contract with god trilogy life on dopsy avenue oh so that's the title they gave it uh in the library of congress that's interesting it varies a little bit 
contents a contract with God, a life force stops you having. Oh, okay. So the Library of Congress has taken all three of them and categorized them in one uh, as one group, right? And I guess that's the ISB N number on it. Interesting. And a whole bunch of other stuff. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna read uh, chapter six, The Enchanted Prince. Okay. And uh, wow, when I read those pages, and it's further down, and I was being blown away as we flipped, uh, and I was reading this, right? And when I hit chapter six, when I read those pages, it was like, wow, wow, wow. So, list of uh, new illustrations, um, a life force front piece, asked insects, when deep purple falls, page 140. So page one, two, and 140 are four or three new pages. Let's go page 140. Let's have a read through that. Let's see what was added. List of new illustrations. So this is one of the new illustrations that was added. Okay. Uh, when a deep purple falls over sleepy garden walls. These could be sketches that they found later on, possibly, right? About the author. If it were from Will Eisner. And these are the other two books, right? A contract with God and Dopsy Avenue, the neighborhood. And for sure, all three of them are going to be the same um, neighborhood they're talking about because this is this place takes place at Dopsy Avenue as well. Um, now, we won't talk about Will Eisner anymore uh, from you know his history and stuff like this. And this is short, I read a fair bit about. Um, his history for uh, in preparation for this reading and he's worked with some of the greats i mean he was friends with bob kane uh the creator of batman and he created some other stuff as well black hawk black hawk is uh, fairly collectible there's people uh chasing that uh sheena queen of the jungle and uh, a whole bunch of other characters that he created as well um, and i highly recommend if you're interested in will eisner's work uh, have a read through his history. I'll give you a little bit of more uh, appreciation of his work and who he was. Uh, and this is page one. And the next one, I guess, page two, the new illustrations that were added. And uh, this page, what does this one say? A life force. Who knows, who knows why all the creatures of the earth struggle so to live? Why they scurry about, run from danger, and continue to live? out of natural span, seemingly in response to a mysterious life force. And those are little insects. And the new illustration. So the question is why, for what? Ask the insects, maybe they know. Let's take a look. And there's chapter one. And one thing he does uh, in this book, he has little uh, sort of advertisements, uh, classifieds, headlines, stories uh, appearing throughout the book with the date on there right so you can sort of get the history get a feel for what what was going on through that period um let's have a read through this as well i think that sort of sets the stage for us so let's take a look at this after the crash of the stock market in 1929 a great depression engulfed western society like a gray cloud Suddenly it seemed to a world rich, uh, to a world which had been in gleeful pursuit of the good life, that living had become survival. Many hitherto unquestioned assumptions now came under re-examination. 
where they could, people relocated from farm to city or city to farm, seeking greener pastures like hunter-gatherers of old. But in the Bronx, on Dropsy Avenue, most tenement, tenement dwellers remained holding fast to their beachhead, simply because they had only just arrived from other more hostile places. They carried with them the tabernacle of a life force they had hardly understood. It was now the middle, the middle 30s. And that must be uh, sort of the uh, the neighborhood, right? And what do these things say? Uh, employment agency, he's got bank there. Uh, he's got rooms over there. So basically a neighborhood that we're going to take a look at, right? We're not going to read too much until we get to chapter six, but let's take a look at some of the stuff anyway. And we'll read, uh, we'll take a look at each chapter, uh, the front parts of it anyway, the, the first page of it. So 1934, uh, and the quote is uh, from Franklin D. Roosevelt. Okay. The withered leaves of industrial enter enterprise lie on every side. The savings of many thousands of families are gone. Unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence. Franklin D. Roosevelt from his first inaugural address. Okay. And the headlines. 1500 homeless live in armory. 69th regiment houses poor. Slump can affect people's health. Increase in illness and reduction of income effect rate of death they have here simply two men faint of hunger in city hall while woman screams definitely uh, gives you a pretty good idea of the setting of this place right chapter one is he to is it the cockroach in the meaning of life the tenement at 55 Dropsy Avenue lay quietly at anchor in its sea of concrete. The sounds of the city were diminishing. Already, one could hear Russ, Russ Colombo singing from a radio on the second floor, uh, floor back. It was Friday and it was sundown, and the last of the regular congregants of the synagogue on the next block we're walking home. And there's people walking home here. You can see in the background, right? Three anyway, so far. When the deep purple falls over sleepy garden walls, and those are the same uh, words right here from page 140, right? And they must be from uh, the radio. Who is this person here is singing this? Already one could hear Russ Colombo singing. So I don't know who Russ Colombo is, right? But I guess those are uh, the words from his lyrics. When the deep purple falls over sleepy golden garden walls. That was page 140. <laughs> Notice uh, on the first uh, reading of this, right? I read this. Uh, a few months ago for the first time and I couldn't couldn't put anything put it down when I picked this up when I started reading um, I read in a few days and uh, whenever I had time off I sat down and read this until I finished it it was very um, addictive it was very much for me it was like Joe Sacco's uh, The Fixer once I started reading it I had to continue to read it and you know we've put on videos on Joe Sacco's The Fixer, right? Um, a couple of videos actually, uh, because I thought that was a magnificent graphic novel, as is this one. So that's chapter one. Beautiful, beautiful pages, splash pages, and just uh, 
his work, right? Absolutely brilliant. And one thing Eisner is really well known for is the animation of his characters. Where their, their expressions, facial expressions, hand expressions, they say so much, so much. I mean, look at this page. Right? You don't get the full view of it. And then you do come closer. And when you come closer, you don't lose detail. It enhances more. You can, you can sort of tell where uh, Frank Miller got all of his shadow work from, right? Will Eisner has influenced so many people, so many people. And I'm really happy that I picked up this book. I'm going to be reading a lot more of uh, Eisner's complete collections. And at some point, I'm going to read part one and part two. And what we're doing here is... Uh, the character that we see here is one of the main characters and he's basically, you know, a carpenter, he's out of a job and um, I believe he was a carpenter anyway, maybe, maybe I've read this a few months ago so I might be mixing up my characters, but he's sort of walking home, he's trying to get a job, he's trying to make some money. <laughs> he's very dramatic and uh, I believe in this uh, in this page it shows him sort of I guess I have a heart attack a lifetime of working for what I ask you ah, he grasps his chest falls to the ground leans on the wall I can't move my legs my chest hurts oi voi I'm dying <laughs> right And a lot of the characters uh, in, uh, in this trilogy are Jewish and there's some other uh, religions and atheists and stuff and it talks about their interaction and whatnot. Okay. And this is his wife, you know, doing the housework and whatnot. And he's actually in the alley that he's sitting, this is his wife doing the, shaking the rugs, right? So it's right underneath uh, the window of his house. Three, Izzy the cockroach fell to the floor of the alley from two flights up. So when the wife was shaking the carpet, right? The cockroach from her apartment fell to the ground right here right. fell right beside the person that he was in the apartment of right and the guy sees him and takes a look at him look at the facial expressions that he does right beautiful and turns to the cockroach and says so mr cockroach what are you struggling for to maybe stay alive a few few days more. Beautiful intro, right? So let's have a little flip through this. Uh, and what we're gonna do, we're gonna go all the way to chapter six, and the pages that we're gonna read are basically from a one-off character, is the main person that represented in that page, and couple of secondary characters well, I guess they could be main characters but one of them one of the one of the ones that uh, he interacts with is a secondary character uh, so this is chapter two uh, SKP south southwest across the Harlem River where the Bronx ends is Manhattan Island there is the land of promise and look at the pages set up I guess this is the Bronx this is where a lot of the poor people are living in the back Right? You see Manhattan sort of like a mirage, a dream. That's what everybody was working towards, right? Riches. And then, 
you know, gives description of who some of these characters are that they're coming across. And here's the, here's the way. Very dramatic as well. Here's chapter, uh, here's chapter three. On the top floor back lived God. On Wednesday afternoons, Hebrew lessons and preparation for bar mitzvahs were conducted by Rabbi Bin, Bin Son at reduced prices for those who could not afford the cheddar, cheater. And when I was reading up on the history of uh, of Eisner, he wasn't uh, he wasn't a religious man. He was proud of his heritage, but he wasn't a religious man. Um, and there was a couple of reasons that were given why he wasn't a religious man. Um, I will not bother getting into those. Uh, chapter four. Shabbat Shabbatskoy Shabbatskoy. Look at the headlines here. 1929, 1930, 1931, 1932. 1929, stock market drops 15 billion on October 29. Sell off worse than history. Uh, 16 million shares traded. 16 million. That's like so little compared to now. Right? Uh, unemployment attacked Senate. Recovery near. Depression peak over, says Hoover, and Hoover didn't know what he was talking about, right? 1930, depression peak over. Hmm. Uh, stock market up, hunger riots fail as Bronx, Bronx March is broken up by cops. Franklin D. Roosevelt wins in a landslide. Anti-prohibition Congress now in O'Brien. Now in O'Brien becomes New York's mayor. O'Brien becomes New York's mayor. So there's a lot of history in this book, a lot of it. 1933. New York Stock Exchange remains closed on Monday, March 13. Assassin's bullet misses Roosevelt in Miami. Banks closed nation nationwide. S Script use planned, 100, 500,000 banknote used at Penn Station, people cashing them for tickets to Newark, Newark. President asked Congress to slash civil service payroll by 500 million. And then you look at the headline back here, 1930, recovery near, depression peak over says Hoover. <laughs> politicians, politicians. Take a look at this one. You know, shows person in his room, tick tock, tick tock, no job. Looks out the window, climbs to the little fire escape thing, <laughs> hangs there, and he's about to commit suicide. There's a lot of people that killed themselves during that period, right? Yo, -ho, Mr. Shatsbury. And he was looking for a job, and if I remember correctly, uh, you know, he gets a little job here to do an errand or something. And that's sort of the beginning where he starts of making a little bit of money. And these are uh, two of the other main characters, their lovers. I mean, look at that. Like the movement of those characters. Look at that. Absolutely brilliant ice skating. And uh, the characters that we see here, um, these two characters and the guy, and on the last page, actually the girl as well, 
uh, the seven pages that we're going to read uh, these characters are in there as well um, but they're not prevalent there's one off character that is the you know he appears in the majority of the pages of the seven pages that we're going to read okay and what these guys are doing are um, you know this guy has something that this guy wants and he's gonna send this girl and try to get it okay that's the story behind um, sort of the setting of the pages that we're going to read and this is the guy right this is the goon and that's his boss so chapter five the black hand what does the muscle say to the kids hey kid this 55 drops you have you yep the kids say chapter five and flip flip and this is chapter six okay <laughs> take a look there's panel we got cockroaches again in the kitchen i scrub i wash i clean every day and still they come back sprocco sprocco bam and cockroaches uh, just to give you my experience with cockroaches when I was going to university I you know as a university student you don't uh, well I didn't anyway uh, I didn't have very much money and we lived in a um, one-bedroom apartment there was three of us living in a one-bedroom apartment um, and the, the complex we were living in was actually you know nicknamed cockroach towers and once you get cockroaches in a building uh you'll never get them out it's impossible you see one cockroach and there's hundreds if not thousands in the walls right they're everywhere so just a heads up if you move into an apartment with cockroaches uh if you're you know they're they're there they're going to be they're everywhere so if you see one there's more okay and uh, maybe someday i'll share with you guys some of those experiences i had as a as a student right they were amazing times amazing times so let's read through this and just to give you a feeling of what's going on here at chapter six these seven pages are sort of they're not disjointed from the rest of this book but they're they stand out from the rest of this book because this guy that we're going to read you know the story about him uh, he's a one-off character okay and um, when I read these seven pages it reminded me of a documentary that I uh, that I watched a while ago I should have looked this up actually um, I think it was called in the realm of the unreal or something like this and it was a documentary about a schizophrenic person that you know had a day job as a janitor I believe at a school or a building that's the documentary that's not the story and at night time he would come home and um, he was sort of schizophrenic so he had an imaginary world he was interacting with and I highly recommend that documentary if you want a little bit more feel of what these pages are going to show you okay and that's what happened when I read this first page Oh, right away on my first reading of this that's exactly what I thought about the documentary and you'll see you know if you see, if you watch that documentary and read these pages you'll see why okay so let's have a read through uh, chapter 6 the enchanted prince okay and this is uh, this story is about this guy this chapter is really about this guy and then at, towards the end he interacts with uh, uh, one of the secondary characters in this book uh, sort of gets involved in the story being told throughout the whole book okay. once upon a time a young prince was born in the Bronx his name was Aaron unhappily somewhere in the divine cauldron where mysterious forces fabricate life something went awry for Aaron 
and the soft circuitry of his brain, an infinitesimal welding failed. Oh, it was only a tiny micro gap between connected tissue, a little cell perhaps that failed from, uh, a little cell perhaps that failed to form or died too soon, but it left forever a flawed engine, an imperfect instrument invisible and unsuspected inside a healthy body so aaron grew up handsome and bright a princeling who seemed destined to inherit a secure place in the kingdom of humankind then one day in early manhood the chemistry that fueled his brain could no longer deal with the flaw and a short circuit occurred unfelt unnoticed but irre irre irrevocable, gradually unreasoned, terrible fear mingled with grandoso dreams in the turret boiling plasma of his mind. His intellect fought for control and this struggle brought him pain. Soon the agony became so debilitary, debilitating that he succumbed to it and he withdrew into himself more and more. At last, he lost touch with reality. In time, the pain subsided, leaving him with a numb fear of people. Finally, he moved into 55 Dropsy Avenue, where he could live out his life in anonymity commonly provided by the tenement walls and sustained, sustained by small remnants from a remote relative a small remittance from a um, remote relative. In this sanctuary, he could make his own world and populate it with creatures of his own invention. Aaron was now truly a prince in an enchanted kingdom. Okay. Can we see the window that he's seeing the world out, right? And the light of the window shining behind them. Beautiful power work or beautiful splash page, right? Absolutely beautiful. So much thought in this. There, in his kingdom, he lived in a murky world populated by the great, the famous, and the powerful. Aaron engaged in an endless dialogue. My calculations concerning the special laws of light, which I wrote in, your calculations are not quite correct. Let me quote from your own thesis. Aaron replies, right? Often he wrote long letters of garbled brilliance and convoluted reasoning on subjects of vague import. Letters that were never mailed, but which nonetheless reflected a stagnant pool of intellect in an imprisoned mind. Dear Mr. President, it appears that you, your recent statement to the press on the state, uh, on the state of this society, are quite, quite naive. Have you considered the forces of evil that? He's writing the letter, and then there's people that he's been interacting with in his imagination. And as for them, the invisible sinister spies who maintained an inexplicable surveillance on him, they needed watching. So in this magical cocoon, the sanctuary from reality, Aaron dealt with the uninvited thoughts and the 
ectoplasmic images that filtered out of the gloom. Go away, go away, he says. Sometimes in the night, when he contemplated the ma magnitude of his infirmity, Aaron addressed God. Why me? What in your what in your grand design, in your infinite calculus, did this to me? I try, but I cannot break out of the iron out of the iron prison. My thoughts that start out so clearly end quickly in a heap, collapsing of their own wait it's not fair there must be a supreme intelligence everything else is so geometrically ordered from the movement of the planets to the configuration of the structure of matter if there is a divine mystery of life then I am a mistake your mistake how could you permit this how could you Ah, then there is no reason. So, therefore, you are not different than all the other creatures that inhabit this room. And if so, then you do not exist. Then go. 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 The next morning, Aaron awoke to a sensation of tranquility. Surprisingly, the threatening images had left his left with the night. For the first time in a long while, he could look upon the real world without fear. Looks out the window. Honk, beep, beep. The remission for the consuming agony left him with a sense of strength and a feeling of curiosity. How he could, now he could go out into the real world to find reality. That's him. That's Shatsbury, boss. Okay, Lupo. Lupo is the gangster that we saw. This guy. Okay. And Shatsbury was the guy that we saw at the beginning that was about to jump out the window, right? So they are entering the, the story right now. And they've been staking him out. They've been following him because they want to rob him. That's the story right now. Sort of give you a little background on it. How do you know he's carrying bonds, boss? Angelo's wife, Maria, she told me. See, he's going uptown. Huh? What's, what's doing with Angelo? I thought he... Nah, he's got a job now. So he's paying up, paying up the society. So I ought to talk to him, old lady. Talk to the old lady. She came through. So 
So what we do is taking the subway, quick. You drive up down to 55 Dobsey. You'll get there before him. Better to take him there. Suppose he gives me trouble. Do what you gotta do. Just get them bonds he's carrying. Sure, boss. And he drives up to Dobsey Avenue, right? There's a sign there, Dobsey. And he goes and stands in an alley waiting for Mr. Shatsbury to come, right? And he's got his gun with him. Here comes Aaron down the alley. Take a look. I'm coming through, look out, the kid says. What do they call these things? Box cars? No, not box cars. It's like a skateboard with a box thing on it. Almost runs down Aaron. And Aaron keeps on coming. <laughs> Looks at the goon. Hold in a sec. The goons are looking at him. What? What do you want? Oh, no, shoes him away. Get away, get away. <laughs> Look at this. Just the facial expressions, right? Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Beat it, nut. Pushes him back. I said, beat it. Let go of my arm. Get, let go, let go. You crazy? Son of a bitch. I'm gonna plug you, let go. garbage can there that's falling over and falls over here right the flow from one panel to the next is brilliant absolutely brilliant bang lupo drops the gun's smoking there's blood splattered on the ground slowly makes his way out goes up the stairs goes to his room so much for reality Space sort of brings it all together for chapter six, right? So let's read this last uh, page for this chapter. Oh, Elton, some hoodlum. Oh, okay, we gotta read this guy first. Becky, I came home for lunch, as I promised. What's happened here? And there's the alley, there's the ambulance, there's the cops, the onlookers, right? Becky. I came home for lunch, as I promised. What's happened here? Oh, Elton, some hoodlum shot himself in the, in the alley. Come on up, I've got lunch ready. And these are the lovers, right? They were skateboard, um, they were ice skating. They're two of the main characters. I can't stay long, Becky. I've got these bonds to deliver to the uptown bank. Sit down, Elton. I made hot chicken soup.
Elton, this bag of bonds you always deliver, is it safe for you? Nothing to worry about, Becky. Absolutely safe. Just brilliant, just brilliant. And this was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages of this book. Wow, look at this. Like, absolutely brilliant. These two pages, actually these three pages, this and these two. Wow. Wow, wow. And then the story continues, chapter seven, the revolutionary. In 1934, the winds of change swirled around 55 Dropsy Avenue, the Bronx. Socialist Party mass meeting broken up by communists. Communist literature ban in New York, New York prison. International communist revolution is forecast. Precursor to McCarthyism, I guess. Or sort of a build up to McCarthyism. Chapter eight, upturn. Stocks rise in response to US dollar policy. Bread lines fade from dowry. So what year is this? I guess it's still 1934, 1935. Job recovery report cites improvement worldwide. Lumber production continues to advance. And the lumber one comes into play with the lumber mill. And there's a lot of things going on here. But I'll leave the rest of the reading for you if you're interested. And uh, this is a life force by Will Eisner. And we never actually read this part, eh? I guess we'll read it now. Uh, the description of this book. We got too excited when I had with the reading. Um, so chronically, not only the great crash of 1929, the Great Depression, but also the rise of Nazism and the spread of left-wing policies throughout the poorest neighborhoods of New York. Will Eisner recreates himself in a life force as De Jacob Storka, whose existential search for the meaning of life reflects Eisner's personal struggle. In this classic graphic novel, Eisner combines the mini miniaturist sensibility of Henry Roth with the grand social themes of 1930s novelists such as Dos Poros and Steinbeck. Let's read this from the foreword. Not only is Mr. Eisner regarded as a master sequential artist, but his graphic novels made him the Einstein of the medium. He is a graceful and con cons he is, he is a graceful and consummate artists whose work offer insight into the human condition. Born in New York in 1917, Will Eisner made the author of the legendary comic strip The, S the Spirit. The comic industry's top annual award, The Eisners, are named in his honor. His other books include A Contract with God and Dropsy Avenue. And a number of other books as well, right? Of course. And that's the panel we read with the cockroaches, right? So I think the next reading I'm gonna, well, the next book that I'm gonna read, not reading, but the next book personally I'm gonna read from Will Eisner. Um, at some point I'm gonna read part one and part two of this, uh, but I'm gonna try to get my hands on the adaptation of Moby Dick that Will Eisner did, okay? Uh, that's our first reading. We're sort of kicking off uh, reading set number uh, number four with this book, Life Force with Will Eisner, and we got 30, 31 more books to take a look at, right? I hope you enjoyed this.
I really do. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye for now.